Okay, so I'm Jeremiah, and this is my friend Oliver. We're a part of the My Brother's Keeper. And to start off, would like to get to know you a little bit, like your name and what you do. Sure. Well, my name is Mark Hughes, and I'm the executive director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. So we've been doing work in the state here for a number of years, racial justice work. Sweet, sweet. You want to ask a uh, first question? What do you guys do? What do we do? Well, we do a lot of stuff. Um, so where the, where the Racial Justice Alliance came from uh, was is, uh, back in 2014 uh, at the death of Michael Brown. Uh, what I decided to do is start a, 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 a kind of like a political action group uh, to address uh, policing in Vermont. So uh, as a result of a lot of the work that we did there, what was created was this, this panel called the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. Uh, and that work led to the creation of the Racial Equity Executive Director's Office and Panel at the statewide level. Uh, and from that point, kind of kind of pivoted into starting this other organization as a result of the, the momentum from the co coalition work. And we started here in the city of Burlington. And some of the work we've done in Burlington uh, was to actually structure. Uh, we pitched the uh, Racial Equity Inclusion Belonging Department uh, in Burlington, as well as the uh, the, uh, the standing committee. Uh, in addition to that, there's um, a lot of work we, we did over the last couple of years in, in terms of uh, you know, driving a policy here in, in, uh, in Burlington surrounding uh, racial equity uh, and also policing. Um, now, the work of the alliance itself, some of it has to do with community engagement and support, helping black and brown folks where they are in the community. Some of it has to do with outreach and education, uh, teaching folks about systemic racism. The, the root causes impacts, uh, as well as uh, some of the solutions. Uh, some of it has to do with cultural empowerment, uh, teaching folks and uh, commemorating and celebrating our, our rich history, our culture, our contribution, our power. Uh, and again, some of it also has to do with the work that we do surrounding policy. Uh, I know that you see, yeah, we all know that you guys do a lot, but what is the most challenging you guys have been, yeah, like you guys face on it. Most challenging. Mm. <laughs> you know, I think in, you know, in doing the work, uh, for, you know, as far as, uh, you know, working in our communities and, and working with our people and, and, uh, and just, just trying to make it, you know, make things better for all of us. I think some of the most challenging work, it, quite honestly, is, is, is just work, just trying to figure out ways and methods for, for us to work together. Uh, in our communities, uh, you know, one example is, is I know um, there's been historically some deeply rooted uh, divisions amongst, um, you know, indigenous African American and uh, refugee resettlement communities right here uh, in the city of Burlington. There's a lot of challenges there because there's a lot of, you know, historical uh, precedents on why uh, folks are not talking to each other and folks are not working together. Some of it is cultural, some of it you know, has to do with our, our division, uh, just as a result of, you know, what is, what the USC, the US, the role of the USCRI and ALV have played. Uh, and some of it has to do with, um, you know, just, uh, challenges that some of us are just, you know, responding to things that we, we've been taught historically. So bringing our community together by far, uh, is the biggest challenge I think that we have. And I, and that's, that's the one that I think we all need to be up to. Sweet. And since um, the kind of like your target is to make a change within the community, how do you, do you feel like you guys have been able to actually do that? Or, or is it just like a work in progress, you know, like ever since you started back in 2014? Yeah, ever since... Uh, that's a great question, and I think part of it has to. The part of the answer, and I'm kind of laughing to myself, is is that quite often I have to remind myself that not only uh, is it a journey, uh, but it's you know it's. And what I mean by that is is that uh, 
you know, as far as the work that we're doing uh, in organizations like us, there was there was organizations like us before. There have there you know ten years ago, fifty years ago, a hundred years ago, in the United States. Uh, this work, y'all will be doing some of this work when I'm gone. Uh, I'm, I'm you know getting up there. I'm like almost sixty years old, right? So I'm so and y'all kids will probably be doing some of this work. And and it's kind of like some people say, you know, we got to keep moving the needle. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is it's, it's a little bit less like a needle and it's more like a pendulum, if you know what I mean. Because it seems like sometimes things are up and sometimes things are down. But we always, you know, we always got to have we got we got to have folks that are up for the fight, uh, which is why I appreciate so much y'all brothers, you know, taking the time out and and learning what you're learning and, and just um and uh, asking all the tough questions, and it's my hope that, you know, as 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 we march on, you know, through time, as we march on, that it'll be you and people like you and and your 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 kids uh, that pick the torch up and keep it moving. But it's a journey. Sure, sure. Well, to kind of get what uh, we were trying to understand, like we said earlier, is the um the equivalent of the like the dollar value mm -hmm. when it comes to um um us as, as black people making and less, yeah. making less and like how kind of that works. Yeah, can you like explain more? Yeah, I and you know and one of the things that I read in the uh, email that came over was is like um the shock and astonishment that y'all had. You were like what? Right, because somebody was like, for every dollar, you know, and, and there was some, you know, you know, I think somebody said two cents, you know, and I, one of the ways that I qualify, um, this, well, let's just call it wealth in equity, mm -hmm. call it wealth in equity in the United States of America. And I'm talking about racial inequities as it pertains, uh, to wealth. Uh, one of the ways in which I'm often qualifying it is, is, uh, this whole idea of generational wealth. Now, there's a huge difference between wealth and poverty, uh, because poverty is just about how much money you have, but wealth is is what you are worth. That means everything that you have, every one of your your assets, add it all together, and everything that you owe, and then you subtract it, and in the bottom line, that's your wealth. And what statistically, what we see is is in the United States of America, the median and, and that doesn't mean average. That's more like, you know, just, well, you guys know median, you're seniors and juniors, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but the median wealth of a black family in the United States is 113. 113 of that of the median wealth of a white family, uh, in the United States of America and widening. Uh, this is all post COVID. Now, when you think about that wealth, in America, uh, in that, that, that disparity. If you really think about that, you can't really fix that with five lifetimes of hard work. There, you cannot close that gap. We're talking about median wealth. So you have to ask yourself, where does that come from? And I, I think that, I think that's really what you guys are kind of like right over the target on is, is where did this come from? How could this be? Right. You know, and, uh, and I think that, you know, we have to look at, we have to look at the history of the nation in order to, to really understand that, to really get our heads around. We have to look at the history of, um, of slavery in the United States of America. Um, but not just stopping at slavery, also uh, taking a closer look at um, what came after slavery and what things happened in the United States that continued to uh, create uh, processes or policies that, that um, ensured that black people in the United States did not have the ability to generate wealth or generational wealth. And in fact, Black people were actually um, not just oppressed or excluded, but also exploited uh, 
after slavery. We read in these books that, you know, slavery was over. You had the proclamation, uh, the um, Declaration of Proclamation of, you know, and then you had the 13th Amendment and it was all over. And that was that. Um, whereas it was much, much more complicated than that. And, um, and even after the 13th Amendment, what we find is, is that, you know, with the 13th Amendment, there was a, a loophole or a exception clause in the 13th Amendment, uh, which stated that except for the punishment of a duly convicted crime, which opened the gate up for this thing that we call convict leasing, which enabled states to create laws um, to criminalize poverty and to criminalize black behavior and also laws to create segregation to ensure that white folks could uh, maintain uh, property, maintain wealth. Uh, and this, this would go on um, throughout, you know, quite some time, you know, all the way up until, you know, the Great Migration, and you'll read more about the Civil Rights Movement, but none of this, none of this had a, a complete resolution, if you will, you know, and we're talking about state sanction. In other words, the government made laws the United States government, even the Constitution of the United States, but moreover, the government itself making laws up that just basically ensured that wealth would be transferred to whites and it would be retained or, or held back from blacks. Even you hear some of the most common stories is the redlining, that is to create restricted zones and neighborhoods and restricted covenants and selling homes. But very little was ever talked about the 270 million acres of land that was given to only white people during the Homestead Act in the 1800s. Uh, the fact that the um, the Social Security uh, Act, as it was signed, the the um, the New Deal that we learned so much about, and even the GI Bill uh, that veterans uh, enjoyed and appreciated, that enabled them to create generational wealth. Uh, by buying homes and then taking the equity in those homes and passing it down to their children, enabling them to go to college and so forth. All of this stuff played into the widening. And there are still many systems in place today. It would probably surprise you to know that we're in the middle of a constitutional amendment here in, in, in Vermont, where testimony will be taken to amend our constitution Thursday of this week to ensure that slavery is prohibited in our constitution in this state, because there are three exception clauses in our constitution in the state of Vermont that have always allowed for slavery under the age of 21 at a person's own consent, and also for the punishment for uh, debts, fines, and, um, and the like. Um, and our, con our constitution predates the constitution of the United States and actually informed the language in the Constitution that permitted slavery, that also permitted slavery in the 13th Amendment. Now, now many would say, and I got a short video to show you in a little bit, but many would say that how could this possibly be? You know, here we are in 2022, and you're talking about something that happened uh, in uh, in 1865. <laughs> That those are those are tough questions to ask, but when we begin to lay this thing out and we begin to look at it, and as we look in the areas of housing across the state, education, in the I'll use education, I'll take a little bit of a deep dive into education because you guys are students, but the disproportionate impact of disciplinary actions against students of color in schools, as well as what we saw to become the school to prison pipeline, um, the the unfair treatment of black and brown kids in our school, which I'm sure you have witnessed, um, and then you know you you get into you know employment, health services, access, economic development, transportation. When you look at those data, and we have them on our website, and there are many who have begun to collect these data, and every single instance, what we see is that black and brown folks are disproportionately and adversely impacted when it comes to the outcomes of each one of these, every single one, to include the criminal justice system. So, you know, if you 
it, and it really is a, it's about economics and I'll just I'll, I'll come back to you for another question but I would just say that even with the criminal justice system as I told you previously you know the from the from the onset you know up to prior to 1865 with slave catching but also uh, beyond that period with the con with convict leasing the um the law enforcement apparatus was was, was a huge played a huge component in um in incarcerating uh and all in you know as in criminalized poverty because if you create poverty in the vast majority of folks uh, at that time if their demographic was poor then de facto what you're doing is you're creating laws that um affect black people more than they do white people proportionately. So so this this has lingered. And and what I was getting at with the numbers is simply that you can see it across all systems. If we go and we take a true look at the history of the nation, we can understand how that connects. Uh, and if we understand the definition of systemic racism, then we start to be able to put this puzzle together and understand why it is that we're seeing this huge disparity economically and the impact that it has on every single one of these systems. Wow, that's uh, that was a lot to take in. Yeah, I think I maybe gave you a little bit too much, but um, but we'll come back to it because hopefully we'll get a chance to catch up as well offline. Uh, I did have a short video for, uh, for you because what I'm holding in my hand right now is this is a report uh, from the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. This is a report from uh, the High Commissioner. And I just wanted to share uh, something with you about just about what she, she had to say uh, about this very same subject, uh, just from a different angle. But I think it pretty much takes you to the same place. Yeah. Hold on, hold on while I get this up for you. Sure. I just want to make sure that I'm sharing the um, volume as well. So listen, uh, as she speaks, uh, and this was just last year, and we can we can talk more about it when she completes. Uh. This is a momentous verdict. It is also a testament to the courage and perseverance of George Floyd's family and many others in calling for justice. As the jury recognized, the evidence in this case was crystal clear. Any other result would have been a travesty of justice. But for countless other victims of African descent and their families, in the United States and throughout the world, the fight for justice goes on. The battle to get cases of excessive force or killings by police before the court let alone win them, is far from over. This case has also helped reveal, perhaps more clearly than ever before, how much remains to be done to reverse the tide of systemic racism that permeates the lives of people of African descent. Now is the time to critically examine the context in which George Floyd's killing took place by revisiting the past and examining its toxic traces in today's society. The entrenched legacy of discriminatory policies and systems, including the legacies of enslavement and transplanting trade, and the impact of colonialism must be decisively uprooted in order to achieve racial justice and equality. If they are not, the verdict in this case will just be a passing moment when the stars align for justice rather than a true turning point. Oh, wow. So there you saw um, the High Commissioner of the, the, the Human Rights, the Human Rights uh, Council of the United Nations. Uh, and I told you what I was holding in my hand was a report, and this report is probably 25 pages, and it goes through all of uh, so much about the observations uh, that the United Nations has made uh, on the um, the treatment of uh, African American uh, Americans of, of African descent here in the United States and their expectations on their responses. So what we're dealing with here is, is we're dealing with something that is is entrenched as the uh as the high commissioner said. And you see this manifest in, in so many different ways, but we always have to remember 
uh, that it really started with the the uh, genocide. It started with uh, slavery, and it was all um, intended uh, for economic uh, for economics. It was all about uh, you know making money. The whole thing was the the false narratives that were created to support and rationalize um, the the inhumane treatment of black folks here in the United States, um, it was necessary to perpetuate uh, what it is that even continues to play out in some different ways uh, to this very day. And what we see is now as we see it, we, what you see more clearly now than ever is, is it's manifesting itself. It has manifested itself, um, you know, economically. Well, it started economically. I, I shouldn't say it manifested itself, but it's, it, that's how it started, and that's what you're actually seeing. Uh, you're probably you're probably seeing it play out across, you know, housing and education and employment. You start to look at it. Um, so yeah, lots lots of lots going on there. Lots to take in, and and we've we've got some uh, some classes, some outreach and education that we're given in the communities. And in fact, we're going to be doing one on Thursday. We're going to be teaching about this, uh, the abolish slavery piece. And then we also have an, an economic empowerment piece that goes with it because there's other policy that we're pushing at the statewide level to attempt to begin to um, to compensate for some of these uh, economic disparities that exist even here in, in the state. Uh, my other question is that since you're talking about like uh, teaching about the book, were you guys like planning on like teaching students like the school or something like that? Absolutely. The um interesting you say that because um I um, um I'm excited. I'm actually first of all I'm gonna I wanna get educated, okay? Um so um I've signed up for some Swahili classes uh that I'm gonna be taking uh next next week. I'm hoping yeah, to be able to <laughs> get to yeah. I got it. First off first I gotta get educated. Um the other thing too is is with my brother's keeper and y'all folks from the school, uh, the, just whoever, uh, is out there who's, who's interested in, in, uh, learning more and also, um, just kind of getting together and talking about it, you know, because we don't, we don't talk enough, you know, we just, we don't hang out and just say, well, what about this thing? And just, you know, wrestle with it. You right. know, a lot of people, they just like to, you know, most people would prefer, or let's just not talk about it at all, you know. Or some people say well, it's such a big problem. What can we possibly do about it? And just choose not to have a conversation about it instead. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I I'm of the opinion now with the Richard Kemp Center uh, that has uh, opened here uh, directly across the street uh, from the uh, Community Health Center of Burlington on Riverside. It used to be the Sam. Uh, furniture store there. You remember that, right? There? Right, right. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. Okay, so that's so that is uh, one of our initiatives, and that's going to be a place not just where um, we can go because it, it, just think about this: if you if what I'm saying is true, and I'm the reason why I say if is is because y'all need to go take a look at it for yourself and make your mind up as to whether or not you believe what I'm telling you. Because people, you know, you watch the news these days, people will tell you anything. Right, right. Um, so I really want, you know, I'm really encouraging, like you said, for folks to come out and have these conversations. But um, if what you're, if, if it is true, and I believe it is, um, in all of the, you know, we have, you know, volumes of data on our site that indicates disparities across all fronts in our history not your books in school, but if you go and, and take a look and start looking through uh, the Internet and, and doing your own research on the history of the United States and reading some other books uh, that are out there, there are many, uh, and start to put it together, then you'll, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that you'll see it. But the point I'm, ma I'm making, though, is, is that if this is true, then this means that at, at the same time, you brothers as black men, okay, Mm -hmm. At the same time that you are being dealt unfairness in, from housing, um, you're getting the same thing on the education front, an unfair outcome. Um, you're getting the same thing on the health services, uh, employment, uh, economic development, right. uh, health, I said health services access, 
uh, transportation, the criminal justice, every single one of those systems are dealing with disparities on you right now, which is making your life harder, economics harder, harder. The criminal justice system, you know, we see the numbers all of the time when you see the race traffic stop, the race uh, traffic stop data, where we see that black and brown people are being stopped hugely at disproportionate rates, being arrested, convicted, tried, incarcerated. Our, our systems are full of us. And that is just another factor, another indicator, if you will. There are many. But all of this stuff is happening. It's coming at you. It's coming right. at us. All of the time. Every day. At the same time. So that's the pressure that we live under as being black in America. And, and it's true. It's, 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 and it's, it's a difficult thing to navigate and to, and it's hard to, it t- look, it took me until I was in my forties to accept it. I rejected right. it numerous times as a kid. Right. You know, I'm a retired army officer and I, I, I chose to not listen to this because I didn't think it was true. But what I'm getting at here is that there needs to be a place for us. So that's what the Richard Kemp Center is about. That's, that's, um, that's not just for, you know, we're, you're going to hear more about it soon. We're going to be opening it up for, for um, some community discussions around some of the programming and activities that we're having. We're hopeful that when y'all come in there, that you guys will figure out your own activities. We'll give some guidance to you. But, you know, we sure. envision there being centers of excellence. There'll be arts. There'll be science. But there'll also be activities and stuff for y'all to do over there. Um, yeah, say again? Sweet. We'll come check in when you guys are open. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, COVID right now is killing us. But, I, <laughs> that way. but I'm just saying, I didn't mean to do that. I really didn't mean to do that. But yeah. but it's it's hard right now. It's hard right now. But um, but yeah, that's going to be a a huge thing for us. First time in our community where we had a black led organization doing stuff in black communities. Um, so y'all, you know, I'm really looking forward to that. The other thing is, is even leading up to that, you know, the hope is is that. You, the two of y'all and folks that y'all know, and, and everybody's not going to be down with it. Okay. Everybody's, everybody, you know, because we're not a monolith. There are some, right. there are some black folks that say, look, this is not an issue and they're going to keep it moving. Amen. Let them keep it moving and that's fine. But there, but there's also, you know, some folks that are like you. And, 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 and the thing is, is that we're not, we don't want to separate people because of course we want to keep the door open. Even folks that who don't believe what we, especially the folks who don't believe what we believe. We want to invite them, even also yeah, white yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Them. We want to, we want to keep the door open just to be yeah. clear, yeah. but we, but we just don't want to, we don't want to forget where we're starting with, uh, where we're, what we're building from. And that is just to create spaces for us to be able to have these conversations and, and also to be able to provide programming like adult basic education, like, um, like, you know, maybe some basic computer skills. Um, maybe we can get some workforce development happening up in there, teach people how to create their own businesses, um, just, a, just a, a, a bunch of stuff happening at the same time, get a recording studio in there, just all kinds of things to just keep it moving and also to, to, to make sure that we are there to care for one another. And in, in every area where the system is, is, is underserving us, that will give us a place to strategize and create ways in which we can compensate for, for those losses. And then the other thing is, is to be able to also have a legacy where men like y'all can leave something for the, the youth that come behind you. Uh, so we can each one teach one and continue to move forward. For sure. That all sounds exciting. And definitely we have a lot more to talk about as, like, as we continue to do this. But unfortunately we are running out of time. So I was going to give you the chance if maybe you had any questions for us. Maybe yeah, I would love to ask y'all some questions. We don't have enough time, so I'll just throw a couple of them at you. Sure. What are your? I mean, I know right now that um, let's see, junior, senior. I think I, I wrote some notes down. Yes. Okay, so um, what do y'all? What are y'all's plans? What? What? what are you? Are you guys going to stay in in Vermont? Is anybody uh, making plans for college to leave here or? Starting businesses, or what, what, are y- what are y'all gonna do next? Basketball stars? Well, uh, I'm mean, trying to go to college after high school. That's the first plan, but I don't know what, like, I wanna do that. 
Okay. Yeah, I'm kind of in, uh, well, I'm in my last year of high school, so I'm kind of in the decision making process, you know, talking to my family and like mm. figuring out what I'm interested in and what they're okay with and stuff like that. So, yeah, one of the things that we've been, we've been, um, planning is, is, uh, just, uh, just a mentor, mentorship program. Right. So I've been talking to folks, you know, um, you know, and, and just talking about, how we can, how we as black men can make ourselves available to y'all. Um, so I'm our, I, so my commitment, first of all, this is recorded. Other people, other people are going to watch this. I'm, I'll make myself available, you know, um, right now and just let both of y'all know, you know, I'm at mark at VT racial justice alliance.org, mark at VT racial justice alliance.org. You don't have to write it down because you can watch this again. <laughs> My number is 401-480-8222, 401-480-8222. And so we have a staff, Isaac Owusu. Uh, we have um, um, Clay Uphis, uh Mukeba. Uh, we also have, um, you probably know some of these folks, um, and, or at least some of their youth, because some of them are, have kids over or have youth over in uh, Burlington. And then we have Maya Longworth, so we got a staff. What we're doing is putting together uh, some opportunities for folks to uh, come out and, and uh, hang out and do some mentoring, help folks with homework. Here's the last question that I have for you. Um, is with y'all, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. COVID, right? It's, it's crazy. It's just crazy. I mean, you got you guys got dealt dealt a bad hand. Mm -hmm. um, I could never imagine being you uh, <laughs> with all of this stuff going on. I've never, I could never. And my, I thought I had it bad when I was in high school. And I'm not. This is not like a pity party because you guys are strong. Um, but, um, I just want to let you know, I'm praying for y'all and my heart does go out to y'all. I love y'all. You guys are amazing. You guys are amazing people. Um, thank you for what you're doing. Um, but what do you need? What do you need help with most? What, I mean, as far as the struggle on a daily basis, how can, how can we help y'all, you know, just go a little bit further, do a little bit more? Well, what do you think? I mean, school, like homework help, yeah. Like tutors, homework? Stuff, tutors and stuff, yeah. Okay. So, you, would, so you think the, the homework is the biggest struggle? Yeah. I would say that as well. But there's a couple of programs here and there that's, that helps a lot. But oh, I would say since in, I mean, my last year of high school, I would say definitely decision making, you know. Like, like this is the time where, like, you have to make a decision that's, pretty much going to change your life so like yeah. just to know what is best for you and stuff like that like maybe some guidance some people that can talk to for my advice mm -hmm. that'd be great yeah like some people can help you yeah like making decisions mentor or something like that <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really helpful and um and um, i think i can reach y'all i can reach y'all through um is there been a transition in the leadership of the, the group there? No, no, just no. Megan. Okay, so I will I will send um so I I will I'll send a note to the uh, email thread that we have going on. I really appreciate um y'all taking the time and Thanks like have you. a conversation with me. I'm I mean I'm honored, really. I'm really honored. I feel um I you know, I feel like I'm the guy that's getting the opportunity here because I don't get a chance to have conversations with y'all and I, I don't have any kids. I mean, I, I got, I got, you know, grandkids and, you know, and some of them are in the high school. I'm not going to embarrass them by calling their names out, but when we get a chance to talk, I'll tell you who they are because I think you know both of them. Um, but, um, but it's just, you know, such a pleasure. And I'm so proud of, of y'all that, that y'all are representing and that y'all, you guys are like working hard and doing the right thing and, and, and digging and discovering and, and call, you know, and, and even saying, you know, hey, you know, I need some help. Sure. That's that. Those are true qualities, you know, true qualities of real men. Real men are not John Wayne. Real men are those guys who, you know, who who cry, uh, who are who who show, um, you know, emotion. Uh, you're gonna shake your head now. <laughs> who show emotion. Who don't who don't mind saying they don't know everything. Right. Uh, sure. And uh, and who support one another. And 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 we. Um, you know, we care for one another. So, um, have never met either of you, but, um, I, I hopefully certainly can soon. tell you. Hopefully soon. Yeah, hopefully soon. Yeah. I hope so. I hope so. As a matter of fact, you know, I told you the Kim Center is not open yet. 
but it's that's just because of COVID. If it's a small number of us, we can meet down there because you know we've got the chairs and all that other stuff in there. We've got what we need. We can even like watch a video or something if it's a small group of us or something like that. And we, you know, really COVID protocols. I I invite you down there. I open that up to you. Um, I love you guys. Love you. You guys are you just to me. That's like this is my heart. This is where everything starts and stops is with y'all. I know that you guys are going to do well. You guys got your heads on straight. Uh, and thank you so much. Are you guys done with me in my dismiss? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, so thank you for taking the time. Thank you. And and good evening to both of you. <laughs>